Hi everyone, this is Nafis, and in this video, we're going to talk about the approach to upper GI bleeds. When you think about a GI bleed, the first thing that should come to mind is if the bleeding is severe or non-severe. And that really just means, is the blood spurting or oozing? If the blood is gushing out rapidly, it's probably coming from a high pressure system, like an artery or varices, which we'll talk about later. The patient is losing tons of volume, so they'll be hemodynamically unstable with hypotension, tachycardia, and maybe an elevated lactate. If they're spurting, you've got an emergency on your hands. If they're oozing, the patient's going to be stable and you'll have some time. The second thing to think about is if the bleeding is coming from the upper or lower GI tract. This video is going to focus on upper GI bleeds. When we're talking about an upper GI bleed, we're usually referring to the esophagus, stomach, and most of the small bowel. When we're talking about a lower GI bleed, we're usually talking about the colon, rectum, and anus. There's a few things you can do to figure out if it's an upper GI bleed without even having to do a scope. If they're puking blood, or to say it in a fancy way, having hematemesis, that's a pretty good sign that it's coming from the upper GI tract. It's way more likely that fresh blood being puked out is coming from somewhere higher up. If they're vomiting up coffee ground looking material, we know it's coming from the upper GI tract since the coffee ground appearance happens when blood mixes with stomach acid. If they're having black tarry stools, or melina, that suggests an upper GI source as well, since melina is what you get when digested blood mixes in with the stool. Let's talk for a second about when bright red blood comes out of the rectum. If the bleed happens from lower down in the large intestine, the blood is pretty far away from all the digestive enzymes in the small bowel, and it's also close to the exit site, so it can just be excreted as bright red blood, also known as hematochesia. So usually hematochesia suggests that the bleeding is coming from the lower GI tract. But if there's hematochesia, you can't always assume it's a lower GI source. You have to be very wary of the worst case scenario, which is a brisk upper GI bleed. If blood is gushing out of the upper GI tract, it's moving through so fast that it doesn't have time to get digested and show up as melina. So it comes out as bright red blood instead. And when that happens, the patients are usually hemodynamically unstable and can bleed to death. So it's really important to remember that when the blood is spurting from the upper GI tract, hematochesia with hemodynamic instability can be the result. When you think you've got an upper GI bleed, the most important thing to tease out at that point is if it's variceal or non-variceal. Just as a quick refresher, in patients with cirrhosis, all the scarring around the liver compresses the portal vein that goes into it. That causes the pressure to build up in the portal vein, also known as portal hypertension. Some of the vessels lining the lower esophagus dump into the left gastric vein, which typically dumps into the portal vein. When the pressure builds up in the portal vein, the blood starts backing up in the reverse direction, to the left gastric vein, and then to the veins of the lower esophagus. Those esophageal veins get engorged with blood, and the plump and juicy veins are called esophageal varices. Since these veins aren't designed to withstand such high pressures, they can burst and bleed profusely. Remember what I said, if blood is spurting, then it should make you think that it's either coming from the arteries or varices, because those are high pressure systems. If they have a history of liver disease, it's a variceal bleed until proven otherwise. When we're talking about a non-variceal upper GI bleed, the main thing that we want to think of is peptic ulcer disease. Peptic ulcers can cause brisk GI bleeds if they get deep enough to erode into a big underlying artery. Like I said, arteries are high pressure systems, so if they're disrupted, you get scary things like hematemesis, hematochesia, and hemodynamic instability. If it's a more shallow ulcer and doesn't really hit any major arteries, the bleed's going to be very minor. You'll get some slow oozing that'll show up as melina, sometimes coffee ground emesis, but the patient's going to be stable and chilling. One of the key things that suggests that you're dealing with peptic ulcer disease is if the patient's been using lots of NSAIDs, like ibuprofen. Remember that NSAIDs are COX inhibitors that block prostaglandin synthesis. And prostaglandins are needed to help produce the mucus that lines the stomach and protects it from acid. Chronic NSAID use allows stomach acid to erode the stomach lining and create ulcers. So if there are stomach ulcers, think NSAIDs. The other most common cause of peptic ulcer disease is an H. pylori infection. But that usually causes ulcers in the duodenum rather than the stomach. There's a whole explanation for this, but I won't get into it. 
It's worth remembering that NSAIDs cause gastric ulcers and H. pylori causes duodenal ulcers because it's a fact that shows up on exams and you might get pimped on it during rounds. Other important causes of upper GI bleeds include a Mallory Weiss tear, which is when there's a tear in the lower esophageal lining that develops after the esophagus gets put under repeated strain. Eventually it can't handle it anymore and it rips a little bit. You should think about it if a patient says that they had several episodes of vomiting, and it was only in the later episodes that they started to notice blood or coffee ground emesis coming out. You'll often see it in alcoholics that are puking constantly with binge drinking episodes, so you might get it confused with variceal bleeding in these patients. Oftentimes though, the patients are going to be a lot more stable because it's more of an oozing type of bleed than spurting. Other causes include esophagitis, gastritis, and duodenitis as well as esophageal and gastric malignancies. In mesenteric ischemia, where there's low blood flow to the small bowel because of a blockage in an artery, that can also cause gradual bleeding from ongoing ischemic damage. Another rare one that you shouldn't forget is an aortoenteric fistula, which is a complication of recent aortic surgery where the wall of the aorta erodes into the GI tract. Remember that arteries tend to spurt, and the aorta is the biggest artery of them all. So this is really, really deadly. If someone had a recent aortic surgery, like an aortic graft for an aortic aneurysm, and they present with hematemesis, it's an aortic enteric fistula until proven otherwise, and they need a surgical assessment immediately. When evaluating a patient with an upper GI bleed, there's a few key things that you would want to know. If they're having hematemesis, you want to know the amount. Are they puking frank blood, suggesting that they're spurting blood from something like esophageal varices, or are there just little streaks of blood in the vomit suggesting a Mallory Weiss tear? We should know what the temporal evolution looks like, meaning that if there was blood in the vomit from the beginning, or if the blood started to show up after several episodes, which would again indicate a Mallory Weiss tear. If the emesis is coffee ground looking, or there's Molina stools, the blood had time to get digested, so it's likely just slowly oozing through the GI tract. If there's hematochesia, it's more likely to be spurting blood and requires urgent intervention, unless it's actually a lower GI source. If they're having abdominal pain, usually in the epigastric region, that suggests some damage in the upper GI tract, like a Mallory Weiss tear, or if it's after eating food, it could be peptic ulcer disease, since the increase in acid secretion with meals irritates the ulcers. Pain with meals could also make you think of mesenteric ischemia, since food entering the small bowel makes it active and it increases its oxygen requirements, but the lack of blood flow causes ischemic pain, almost like bowel angina. Use of NSAIDs, or even daily baby aspirin, is important to know because that also suggests peptic ulcer disease. Similarly, you should also ask if they're on blood thinners for something like AFib or a mechanical valve. The most important piece of information is actually finding out if they have any history of liver disease or significant alcohol use. Because if they have cirrhosis, you're going to assume that it's a variceal bleed until proven otherwise. You also want to get a sense of how much blood they've lost by asking if they have any chest pain, which would suggest demand ischemia and also any syncope or lightheadedness that suggests that their volume deplete. On exam, you're obviously going to want the vitals. If they're tachycardic or hypotensive, that suggests that they've lost tons of blood and you need to pump them with fluids and transfusions to restore their volume. You can check their mental status and make sure that they're alert and oriented. If they're not, either they're in shock and there's not enough perfusion to the brain, or they're cirrhotic and you worry about a variceal bleed causing hepatic encephalopathy. When a cirrhotic patient has bleeding varices, all that blood flooding their GI tract has lots of protein that gets digested, and ammonia is a byproduct of all that protein breakdown. All that ammonia gets absorbed into the blood. Since the damaged liver can't clear ammonia in the same way that a healthy one can, the ammonia builds up in the blood and goes to the brain, causing encephalopathy. If the level is high enough, it can cause brain edema that leads to herniation and death. On that same note, you want to look for signs of liver disease like jaundice, ascites, and splenomegaly which again suggests that you have a variceal bleed on your hands. When sending off labs, of course you're going to send a CBC, and the hemoglobin's obviously going to be in the toilet, right? Well, the initial CBC might not actually be reliable. The hemoglobin on a CBC reflects the concentration of hemoglobin. If the patient lost a ton of blood and you get a CBC right away, it's just going to be the same concentration of hemoglobin in a smaller volume of blood. It's only after the low volume triggers ADH release and your kidneys absorb water to fill the blood vessels back up with fluid, that the hemoglobin gets diluted and shows up as low on a CBC. But that takes time, so you can't rely on the initial CBC, 
You'll want coagulation studies, like an INR and PTT. If the INR is high, that can tell you about their predisposition to bleeding, especially if they've been on anticoagulants like warfarin, which you might decide to hold in reverse. It can also suggest that the patient has liver disease, but know that INR is not a reliable measure of bleeding tendency in cirrhotic patients. More on that later. You can also get a sense of their liver function by sending off albumin and bilirubin, as well as liver transaminases. I like to send off a lactate to get a sense if there's decreased end organ perfusion and if they're going into hemorrhagic shock. But this can be falsely elevated in cirrhotic patients since the liver normally clears lactate from the blood. If the patient has an upper GI bleed and is digesting blood, the proteins in that blood can be metabolized to urea. That causes the urea in the blood to go up much more than the other waste product that usually goes up with it, the creatinine. The ratio of urea to creatinine ends up being greater than 20 to 1. Alright, now for the fun part, the management. The key is to resuscitate, resuscitate, resuscitate. Deal with the ABCs first. If they're having ongoing massive hematemesis, or if they have altered mental status and aren't protecting their airway, you might need to intubate them before the scope. If the patient is bleeding, the first thing to worry about is stopping them from bleeding to death. You stop them from bleeding to death by restoring their volume and end organ perfusion. You'll need access with two large bore peripheral IVs, and you can give them fluid boluses to fill up that intravascular space. You can give them transfusions of packed red blood cells, targeting a hemoglobin of above 70. Don't be overaggressive with blood transfusions, especially with variceal bleeding. Since varices are veins, they're not meant to withstand high pressures. That's what caused them to bleed in the first place. If you pump them up with too much blood, that makes the varices even more plump and makes them spurt out even more. Being too liberal with transfusions in these patients is actually associated with a higher rate of re-bleeding and mortality. With fluids and transfusions, you can keep a close eye on the blood pressure to make sure that it's coming up appropriately. If the INR is elevated, you can consider correcting the coagulopathy. If they've been on warfarin, you might want to give the patient back the clotting factors that have been depleted, which are present in blood products like fresh frozen plasma, or FFP, and also prothrombin complex concentrate, also known as octoplex. Beware of the INR in cirrhotic patients though, since it's not reliable. The INR is going to be high because the liver isn't making vitamin K dependent clotting factors, but that doesn't mean that they have a bleeding predisposition because the liver also isn't making other anticoagulant proteins, like protein C and protein S. So giving FFP to patients with variceal bleeding doesn't help, and can actually make things worse by unnecessarily bloating the varices even more. The next key thing is acid suppressive therapy. You want to give them a loading dose of a proton pump inhibitor, like pantoprazole, 80 mg IV, and follow this shortly with a continuous infusion of 8 micrograms per hour. The IV proton pump inhibitor is key because you really want to reduce the amount of stomach acid in the setting of a GI bleed. It's useful because acid is what activates pepsin in the stomach, which breaks down protein as part of the normal digestive process. When you have a lesion that's spurting blood, you're going to want a clot to form there, but the pepsin is going to attack the proteins that hold the clot together. Lowering the stomach acidity helps inactivate pepsin and allows the clot to stay intact. Platelets also don't stick together as well in an acidic environment, so lowering the acidity helps the platelet plug form as well. Finally, it's not going to help a bleeding lesion when it's bathing in acidic fluid, so getting rid of some of that acid is useful from that perspective as well. Finally, you're going to want them to be NPO for an EGD. Think about giving a promotility agent like IV erythromycin or Maxaran before the scope. It helps the stomach move blood out, and the last thing that you would want is to go in with the scope and not be able to see where the bleeding is coming from because of there's nothing but blood everywhere. If you suspect variceal bleeding, you're going to do all the same things except for correcting the coagulopathy. On top of the panto infusion, you'll add on octreotide. Octreotide is a somatostatin analog that helps lower the portal venous pressure, which will help make the blood spurt out of the varices a little bit less. The dose is easy to remember because it's 50 and 50. You'll give a loading dose of 50 micrograms and then run an infusion of 50 micrograms per hour. Then you give antibiotics, usually 1 gram of ceftriaxone. The reason you give antibiotics is because in variceal bleeding, you're creating a big portal of entry for bacteria from the GI tract to enter into the bloodstream, as well as the ascites that cirrhotic patients usually have. When bugs access the abdominal fluid, they can get spontaneous bacterial peritonitis, which is when that fluid becomes infected. We know that giving antibiotics is one of the things that actually improves mortality in these patients by 10%. So in cirrhotic patients, you always want to give this variceal triple cocktail of pantoprazole, octreotide, and ceftriaxone 
Once you actually go in there with a scope, you can find out where the bleeding is coming from, and you can actually do something about it endoscopically. You might see lesions with a low risk of re-bleeding, like an ulcer without any evidence of recent bleeding, or just some generalized inflammation like esophagitis, gastritis, or duodenitis. If you see these, it's pretty easy. You can just give them an oral PPI once daily, let them eat, and stop NSAIDs. On the other hand, you might see ulcers with high-risk stigmata. You might see a visible vessel on the ulcer, an adherent clot, or even active bleeding. For these patients, they can inject epinephrine and either cauterize or clip it to stop the bleeding. Then they could stay on the Panto infusion for 72 hours, but there's some variation as to whether you give Panto 40 mg IV twice daily or just run the infusion. Then after 72 hours, they can be stepped down to an oral PPI twice daily. You can often put them on a clear fluid diet for 12 to 24 hours before letting them eat a regular diet. If you see varices, you can do band ligation to stop them from bleeding anymore. You'll keep the octreotide infusion going for another 2 to 5 days, and you can also keep giving ceftriaxone once daily for a maximum of one week. So there you have it. To summarize a few key take-home points, an upper GI bleed in a cirrhotic patient is going to be considered variceal until proven otherwise. You're always going to want to start them on that triple cocktail of a PPI, octreotide, and antibiotics. When you're dealing with a non-variceal upper GI bleed, the most common thing is going to be peptic ulcer disease. The first step is always to resuscitate, 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 focus on giving the patients back the volume that they've lost, and once they're stable, then you can move on to those fancy endoscopic treatments. Thank you so much for watching this video. If you felt like it was helpful, please give it a like, share it with your friends, and subscribe to the channel.